Welcome to Circa. In this Eat Here episode, we will be listing a lot of mind-blowing, down-and-dirty, mouth-watering spots in New York City. So with that in mind, we're going to tell you a lot. But don't worry. There will be maps, notes, and info on the places mentioned in these guides in the Circa app. So whether you're in New York, heading there right now, or sometime in the near future, or would just like to learn all about a place we truly love, you're in the right place. This is what we do. So just sit back, put your headphones on, and enjoy the ride. Let's go take a big bite out of the Big Apple. Circa. Love the world you live in, and we'll help you explore it. You've arrived. On a stale air jet plane, or a crammed bus, or a plush train, you're excited, you're exhausted, you're famished. Get used to those first two being your companions your entire time here. But one thing that New York can really deliver on is satisfying the grumble in your belly. In this episode, we're diving into the gluttonous, gastronomical joyride of a city filled with extraordinary diversity. And the only way I'm going to be able to get away with one entire episode devoted to culinary New York genius without immediately falling short and starting a riot in my own head is to narrow the playing field because it's impossible to tell you everything about food in one episode. There are over 25,000 restaurants in the city, and that's just the official eateries. And everyone here has their places. So let's for a moment suspend the fact that there are some of the finest restaurants in the world here. That there are people who spend their lives just arranging the flowers at these places, and you really can ride a cloud on truffle foam all the way to the symphony. There's something to be said for sitting among the clink and clank of gilded glamour, putting delicate morsels of paradise in your mouth. Let's just take a moment to pay homage to every place I'm not going to mention. All those new natural wine bars and century-old steakhouses and greasy diners and plant-based five-star kitchens and Dominican spots on the corner that blow your mind with eight buck per nil. None of which I am going to touch on. Instead, get your hand sanitizer ready, because we're mainly going to throw away the utensils. Let's dive into the fundamentals, the place from which the great flavors all began, the food that people who came to work here ate, until everyone else soon realized it was the best thing around. This is where to eat in New York, with your hands. I'll be honest. There's just something different about food you eat with your hands. Maybe there's no middleman. Maybe it's just closer to our original nature. You can't eat a bagel with a fork or knife. And unlike in Italy, same goes here for a slice of pizza. You gotta get up into it. You have to risk a little mess. In a city that's so expensive, it can be hard to find any reprieve in your pockets. And yet, if you know where to look, New York can be extremely reasonable. You can still get a taco for $1.50. Or you could pay $8. And honestly, unlike a lot of other things in life, what you pay for is not always what you get. The weird thing about New York is how much crappy food there is, too. How anyone makes it here serving subpar fare with sky-high rents and a million discerning palates is beyond me. But believe me, it's just as easy to find something mediocre. So no, not everything here will be delicious or worth the adventure. And a lot of the famous things are the best things. So if there's a long line, there's probably a reason why. Though not always. Also, nothing is for granted. So make sure things are open before you take three buses going to the end of Queens to get those dumplings. And since this is our guide to New York, 
I want you to go places you might not go and see things you might not have seen. An overview of New York food via someplace else. Most of the things we love in the world came from scarcity, often from people trying to get enough to eat with the little they had. How to keep something from going bad, how to spread something to last longer than the sum of its parts, how to use salt and spice to your advantage. Out of necessity comes creativity. What do you do with all that milk once it's out of the udder? cheese. What do you do with fish and meat without a fridge? Salt it, brine it, smoke it. Hence, the deli was born. One of my favorite food books that's not a food book is A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. In this classic account of growing up in a poor community neighborhood of Brooklyn at the turn of the last century, it's the ingenuity of what little can be made to last and how to fill the belly with the scraps that sticks with me. Read through the pages and you'll find the simplest things making your mouth water, like transformed stale bread pudding and puckery pickles. Nothing fancy, just delicious. To taste something is to touch a culture, and for people who have endured histories of oppression, food can be a subtle insurrection into people's hearts. It used to be a lot harder to call an Italian garlic eater once you were addicted to their pizza, with sauce dripping with that stinky, gorgeous bulb. Or even today, talk smack about immigration as you gobble up tacos and pho and momos and arepas. Food is political. Food is personal. Food is the ultimate diplomat. In New York City, everyone is from somewhere else. Unless you are of the Lenape tribe, and honestly, New York kind of screwed up in the hospitality on that front, to say the least. Otherwise, the Dutch get to claim first culinary rights. but. Besides the occasional hollandaise sauce, you aren't going to find much trace of that cuisine here. So let's instead begin with the first people that really made New York a foodie hotspot. The original nosh. It can be argued that more than any other group, it is Jewish food and tradition that has left its stamp on New York City. Long before vegan became cool, you could get kosher tofu cream cheese anywhere. It's why the pickles here are sour and not sweet, and why every hot dog here is 100% beef. It's why we're the only ones in the world who have appetizing shops dedicated to all things you could put on a bagel. It's a legacy that has gladly endured, one that is enshrined in the deli case of many institutions around the city. A living legacy, and one we all partake in its enjoyment. First and foremost, the bagel and all its trimmings. That holy, doughy, baked roll of completeness. According to tradition, bagels come from Poland, of course, the bagel we know and love in the city, boiled, then baked, seems to have come out of some religious intolerance where Jews were only trusted to boil their bread first, so as not to poison the genteels. Fun times. Bagels are simple. Flour, water, yeast, malt. They are traditionally kettle boiled, not steamed, and then baked and rolled in seeds. A perfect bagel should have the right chew, a soft interior, a kind of pull to the outer crust, a bit of a spring, but also enough density to stand on its own. A perfect bagel should make you feel like a puppy does when given its fresh, chewy dog treat. Okay, you're at the bagel shop. It's a legit place, so you notice. There is more than one kind of salted fish on the menu, and you're thinking, bagel and lox. A bagel with smoked salmon, right? The truth is, lox isn't even smoked. It's cured. Say what? Yep. True lox is the belly of the salmon, cured in salt, 
and the process leaves it briny and intense with a buttery texture. Some say the modern bagel with cream cheese was invented just to cut its intensity. The most popular, smoked Nova salmon, is a cold smoked salmon, a little more mild, less salty, and just as buttery. There's also often salmon pastrami, cured with sugar and spices and then smoked. Or sable, a rich black cod, white-fleshed fish that is also smoked. Or you can take a whole other direction and order the white fish salad, made with mild fish, cold smoked, and usually mixed with mayo or sour cream. Nowadays, most bagel stores, even the better ones in the city, will call their smoked salmon lox and not even bat an eye if you do too. But if you happen to go into a real appetizing shop, many that have been around for 100 years, Barney Greengrass or Zabar's on the Upper West Side, Russ and Daughters in the Lower East Side, Shelkies in Brooklyn, Essa Bagel, Tal Bagels, you'll be able to navigate the waters. I like to eat Nova salmon with a thin red onion, capers, and cucumber on a fresh, everything bagel, a black coffee, a New York Times paper version. Some things should evolve, and some things should stay the same. Next up, the knish. Besides just being a satisfying word to have in your mouth, a brief shout out for this Ashkenazi Jewish tradition. A baked morsel of dough surrounding the traditional mashed potato and onion, or a million other fillings. Cheap and delicious, there used to be knisheries all over New York. Now there is only one dedicated to the hearty snack. Yona Schimmel Knishery on Houston Street since 1910, a throwback to when the Lower East Side was mostly Eastern Jewish immigrants. I prefer the knishes from Barney's Greengrass, but Yona's is so iconic, the thought of it not being there is enough to keep making sure people always will be dropping by and grabbing one. Or three. And what's admittedly more than a nosh, lastly, the pastrami sandwich. It's true. Eating meat is the worst thing we could do for climate change. That cows are sacred. So, how to justify three inches of meat between slices of bread parading as a sandwich? Honor it by getting the best, and then honor it again with all of your sublime attention. A pastrami sandwich done right should make you close your eyes, suspend time and space and any conversation you are having for that first bite. A good pastrami sandwich should make you feel like you are on Star Trek, beaming to another planet. And where do you find this? At Liebman's Delicatessen in the Bronx. Far from the touristy spots in Manhattan, the hustle and bustle of the Upper West Side joints and the more famous Jewish delis, lies one of the oldest Jewish delis in Riverdale, Bronx. In an area once more populated with Jewish delis than traffic lights, now Liebman's is the last one standing. And lately, it's been getting its fair dues as one of the best delis in New York City. But I like to think of that as old news for those of us in the know. You can get everything here. Brisket, tongue, turkey, matzo ball soup, pickled herring. But the pastrami is what makes the trek sacred. Pastrami is a labor of love. Often made from the fatty navel cut of beef, the meat is first brined for days or weeks, then dried, then seasoned, then smoked, then steamed till the gelatin of the meat takes on a whole new texture. And what was once tough turns tender. Finally, it's carved by a well-trained hand. Traditionally, it's served warm on rye bread, with mustard, of course, and pickles and slaw on the side. And that's exactly how you'll find it at Liebman's. Most shops don't make their own pastrami for good reason, Every batch of pastrami is like building an edible cathedral, but Liebman's prides itself on the painstaking process. And no, a pastrami sandwich is not cheap, nor should it be, considering the amount of meat, process, and attention. But you can still eat it with your hands, both of them, of course. Beyond the taste, just going to Liebman's is a throwback to a different era of customer service. You'll feel attended to here, taken care of, you can tell because half the place is filled with regulars that feel more comfortable here than in their own kitchens. The 
the New York Slice. Is there anything like the combination of fresh hot dough, the tang of tomato sauce with the creamy melty pull of cheese to make you feel like a five-year-old dancing around the room? Pizza. It's a religion here. Yeah, its roots are Italian. Napolitano, to be exact. But really, pizza as a worldwide phenomenon should be credited to southern Italians who came over to New York in droves at the turn of the century, and like their ancestors back home, needed cheap, on-the-go, affordable food. Believe it or not, pizza wasn't really a popular thing outside of Naples until then. Pizza, as an institution, is American. Pizza is so smart. The ingredients aren't that expensive. You can sling a pie out fast and feed a family. It's good hot. It keeps cold. Kids love it. Their parents love it. Their grandparents love it. There is a lot of amazing pizza in New York, with heirloom crusts and upstate burrata, wood-fired, Roman style. But the iconic slice is a floppy triangle covered in bubbly, low-moisture mozzarella. It's simple. It's meant to be eaten fast, as a companion to the rest of your life. So where should you go for your slice? Joe's iconic, almost cartoon slice in Greenwich Village, or Patsy's in Harlem, the only excuse still to use coal in this modern age. Neither will disappoint, and both have endless imitators across the city by the same name trying to be them. Or let the newcomer's scars in the Lower East Side put the other slices to shame with their milled-in-the-basement fresh flour perfect crust. For the full sit-down experience and the feeling that all New Yorkers both relish in and hate waiting forever for something good, it would be hard to pass up Locali in Carroll Gardens in Brooklyn. You can wait five hours just to get in, and their menu is all of two items. Pizza. Calzone. They don't even have wine. All the better because you can then bring your own. But there's a reason why people flock there. Wood fired perfectly with a crust that thumbs its nose at the typical New York flop, they top their swoon-worthy sauce with three cheeses, buffalo mozzarella, low-moisture mozzarella, and shaved grana padano, and throw enough basil on it to reawaken the ancestors. Also, the man behind the pies bought the place to keep the old candy store of his youth from turning into another Rite Aid or worse. So it's charming as hell, and it's all the reasons why we live in the city. So suck it up and get on the list. Some people would kill me for not mentioning Roberta's or Defara's or whatever other favorite spot they hold dear to their heartstrings. So I'll be sure to throw some more favorites in the notes for you. But you get the point. I can't win. You can't lose. There's pizza everywhere. The truth is, Every neighborhood has its spot, and you'll find there becomes a certain allegiance towards it. Where I live, there's a place that's been closed for years due to a fire which just reopened. Rocky's Pizzeria. No frills, not a destination in any guide, not even great by any stretch. But it's a neighborhood spot, right on the busy corner of Church Avenue and Coney Island Avenue, otherwise filled up with gas stations and auto mechanics. And when you walk by and smell that smell, it hits you like a football of nostalgia. You can just tell when a place is good. There's a vibe coming from it, an ancient sensory validation. I assure you, put a few of these hotspot destinations on your list, and still, at some point, it's gonna be close to midnight, and you'll be walking by some random pizza joint in some random New York neighborhood and you'll grab a slice for three crumpled dollars in your pockets, and you'll stand there on some formica counter with chili flakes and parmesan in sugar shakers. And you'll laugh, thinking it might be the best meal you've had in a while. Hot doggity. There was a time when German immigrants had huge representation in New York City, largest behind the Irish. And while some stayed and assimilated, it's not as much seen in the historical lineage as the Italians or Jewish mainstays of communities. But if there's one flagpole still standing in that history, it's the Frankfurter, that ubiquitous American hot dog. 
hot dogs in this country are made of the trimmings of anything, mostly pork, eaten on cheap buns in backyard barbecues with ketchup and relish to please the kids and the pocketbooks. But in the hot dog cities of the purists, Chicago and New York, they are 100% beef to give a nod to the German Jews who kept kosher, and only with condiments that cut the meat and don't coddle it. Those hot dog carts on every corner might tempt you, but they can't always be vouched for maintaining good hygiene. So while it's a New York rite of passage, it also has a try at your own risk, unsaid motto. Instead, head to Gray's Papaya. Stand by for college students and lunchtime mongers. What used to be a substantial franchise has now dwindled to one flagship store due to rent increases and pandemic fallout. But still, it's worth the visit for a feeling of old-time nostalgia and a perfectly delicious hot dog that is still one of the only ways to eat a meal in the city for under five bucks. Also, what other fast food tradition has tropical juices instead of soft drinks on the menu? A papaya or pina colada juice instead of a Coke? Yes, please. Many of you looking for the best New York deli will no doubt come across Katz's Deli, the famous Lower East Side deli of Mile High Pastrami, where Meg Ryan had a fake orgasm and one sandwich could appropriately feed most families for dinner. The lines are long, the atmosphere electric, prices verging on gouging until you consider the portions, and yet I would never tell you to not go. Things are famous for a reason, and Katz's is an experience in itself worth the counter ticket. But here's a twist. Skip the sandwich line. Take my advice and take the trek to the Liebmans for your pastrami. But do go to Katz's for the hot dogs. Fatty, juicy, perfectly cooked. There's a separate counter. Get it with spicy mustard and sauerkraut. That's all you need. The meat is already seasoned. The mustard and kraut cut the fat and don't coddle it. No ketchup. Yeah, let's take a moment to talk about ketchup. See, you can get duped with ketchup because of the acid, but the sugar in ketchup kills the balance of a perfectly salty dog. It's like ordering a cappuccino at 3 p.m. in Italy. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to listen to our guide to Rome. That's the difference between a tourist and a traveler. A traveler wants to learn, slip into the cracks, find the rhythm of another way of life. The tourist comes to look with a bit of distance and comfort sees things through the bus windows and not their feet. I'm not here to judge. We can all be that guy. I'm just here to tell you not to be that guy when it comes to dressing your dog. Over the moon cakes. Chinese bakeries. With all the fancy $4 croissants and cronuts and cupcakes overwhelming New York, it's hard to beat a $1.25 pastry that is often fresher and better. Welcome to the Chinese bakery. And when you realize it can be savory and satisfy lunch for pretty much the same price, you feel like you're cheating all the other fools suffering their savings. Unlike the assimilation of Italian, German, Jewish, and Irish people and their food into what has been seen as iconically New York, Chinese food and people have been unfairly left out. New York City has more Chinese people than any individual city outside Asia, but it's not always included as what makes New York New York. While almost all immigrant communities were initially ghettoized in enclaves of representation, Chinatowns tend to remain their own satellites even today. Partly, that's about racism. But partly, that also means cultures have remained more intact, along with language, tradition, and food. For the first 200 years, Chinese immigrants had few options for employment, save the laundry or opening a restaurant. So there's quite a long history of Chinese food in the city. But the fast food Chinese restaurant of sweet cornstarch and mild, pleasing tastes that have proliferated many people's ideas of Chinese food has recently, thankfully, been blown open by a slew of new restaurants offering all the nuance, spice, funk, and craft of diverse Chinese cuisine, as complicated and exalted as French cuisine. And yet, 
If you want a cheap, good meal, it's rare to find more options than in Chinatown. And there still remains a sweet spot for the Chinese bakery. Moon cakes, egg custards, pineapple buns, rice rolls with dried shrimp and sweet, salty sauce, steamed tender pork buns, sticky rice wrapped in bamboo leaves. My favorite are the sesame balls, tender tennis balls of goodness, glutinous rice flour filled with sweet red bean paste, deep fried and rolled in sesame seeds. It's the original vegan donut, especially when paired with hot, strong, milky tea. Heaven. There are fantastic Chinese bakeries in Queens and Brooklyn too, but your surest bet is to head to Chinatown in Manhattan. Smashed up between City Hall, Soho boutiques, and the trendy Lower East Side, Chinatown remains the dense heartbeat of Lower Manhattan. You can wander the dense streets and take your pick, but two of my suggestions are hole in the walls that won't show up on your Google search. Try Nice One Bakery for its selection of savory and sweet and being able to sit at the tables next to old timers reading the Sing Tao Daily. And Ho Wan Bake Shop. I don't know where else you can get a fresh steamed pork bun or rice roll with dried shrimp for $1.50 and be satisfied. Just bring cash. These are old school joints and most don't take cards. Mexico in the house. For much of the century, the Latinx population in New York City was dominated by Dominican and Puerto Rican culture. And while that's still going strong, Mexican workers, long part of kitchens and the workforce here, have started to have more of a forward face with their own cuisine. And everyone's benefited. New York used to be ridiculed for its Mexican food. No more. The tamale. If you've ever made tamales, you know it's a painstaking process that's delicious but demanding and something to be made in big batches. It's associated with home and hearth. The history of tamales is old. And unlike almost every other food craze that has gotten its hybrid makeover, tamales tend to stick to their original roots. Corn masa made into a dough stuffed with stewed fillings and steamed in a corn husk. The result is a complete warm package, a blanket to cozy up to in your taste buds. Often made by women, it's historically been one food that has kept the tradition even as an enterprise. So two of the best and most loved tamale institutions in New York City are each owned and operated by women selling in carts on the street. Yolanda's at the top of Manhattan in Washington Heights and Avelia's in Corona, Queens, under the rumbling seven train. The taco. Small griddled corn tortillas filled with seasoned meat and topped with chopped onions and cilantro and finished with fiery fresh salsa. What's not to love? And yet, why do so many people screw this up? Now you can find everything from the most authentic street taco to the kimchi hybrid. All over the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, and yes, even Manhattan, there has been a bit of a taco renaissance in New York City these last many years. And some of the best tacos you'll find in New York are actually just in the back of Mexican bodegas, like Guadalajara del Dia, Dos, in Queens, or Reyes Deli and Grocery in Brooklyn. But my pick is still the Tacos El Bronco food truck in Sunset Park in Brooklyn. Go at 12 a.m. and sit on the sidewalk waiting for your order with all the other workers and tipsy late-night meanderers. The menu is long, and here you can find cuts of meat you might not have ever considered before, pork stomach or veal head. But what really makes it stand above the rest? Every order comes with a grilled, juicy spring onion, fresh radishes, and plenty of lime to cut the grease. These tacos are not fancy, and yet scratch an itch unlike most. Grab a beer from a nearby deli and find a curb to just sit down and bite into bliss. I have spent my entire day's wages on some restaurant meal that left me still hungry, only the next night to spend less than 10 bucks eating fresh tacos on a street corner, feeling righter than rain. 
Just to know, they also have a storefront nearby on 4th Avenue and 44th Street in Brooklyn with a larger menu. But I prefer the taco truck. Just check Facebook for the location. There's a link in the notes. You might also come across Los Taco Number no. 1 on your list, and for good reason. They are pretty damn fine tacos. And since you'll probably be somewhere where this little authentic chain pops up, count yourself lucky. Rest assured, if you are stuck coming out at Grand Central famished, don't try to make it all the way to Sunset Park. Go get a couple blow your mind adobada tacos and an agua fresca at Los Tacos and catch your breath. Otherwise, make the trek. Trini time. Find yourself in Crown Heights or Flatbush, Brooklyn, and you'll find a whole other diaspora via the Caribbean. In the summer, it's often loud and boisterous. And if you're lucky enough to be around in early September, you can catch the West Indies Parade pumped down Eastern Parkway, where the whole street becomes the best club in New York, with everyone dancing wrapped in the colors of their country's flags. Let's just say the representation is real. But for all the other times of the year, you can partake in the basic need of filling your belly with the deep wisdom of Caribbean cuisine. The roti, specifically the Trinidadian roti, is a wrap made with stretchy thin bread and yellow peas, then stuffed with spiced potatoes, curried chickpeas, and stewed meat or veggies, fragrant, Inexpensive, protein-filled, it's a perfect meal. It's often unknown outside certain neighborhoods, but if you live in Brooklyn near Flatbush, you know the roti. Like everything, you have options. My pick is the Hot Pot near Prospect Park. With a clientele as seasoned as their chana, they do a brisk service that will make you quickly feel like an amateur unless you know what to get. No frills, no tables, just the food. And the food is good. The roti here is huge, like a baby blanket to swaddle around any of your appetite's anxieties. Go for the tender bone-in chicken or stewed goat. Get your roti wrapped with both the tamarind and homemade pepper sauce. Just beware, that shit is not playing and we'll burn a hole out your smokestack. Cash only, of course. Eat your heaven. Nepalese momos. Okay, this might be cheating a little, because you may want to eat these with utensils, especially if they are fresh and delicious enough to split their seams right then and there. In Jackson Heights, Queens, among the Bangladeshi superstores, Punjabi sweets and kebab houses, there is a little empire of a Nepalese specialty, the momo a fresh dumpling filled with aromatic fillings and steamed or fried and eaten often with spicy sauce. Every year, the neighborhood does a momo crawl where hungry mouths fiendishly descend on the small, dense neighborhood to determine the best momos around. Banchar Gar has won four years in a row and for good reason, although really you probably aren't going to go wrong anywhere you try. But at Banchar Gar, you'll be greeted by glinty-eyed namaste, far from the yoga mat by Yamuna, who immigrated to Queens and opened the shop in 2015. Here, there is plenty of ginger, turmeric, curry, and garlic to sweat out one's worries. But what really stands out is the Joel Momos, dumplings swimming in a rich, redolent soup of crushed sesame, spice, and pungency. Also, try the goat barbecue, served with fresh daikon, puffed rice, and mustard oil pickles. The next day, I still felt it chewing out of me, its richness a whole other kind of divine. Just don't go expecting a quick bite or the most romantic setting. There might be weird, strange YouTube travel shows on the TV, and there are no candles in sight. But everything is handmade with flavors that are both nostalgic and unique all at once. So grab yourself some butter tea while you're there, sit back, and give in to another way. Hungry yet? 
there's no way to win or really lose in this city. Because once something is really popular, it can't help but change. Start worrying about its Instagram, open five chains all over the country, lose that thing that made it so great. Or it just can't sustain the hustle or the rent and closes despite being beloved. But just when you can't believe your favorite spot is gone, your allegiance broken, the town's gone to hell, you'll find another one tucked in some corner with someone who's been cooking for 50 years with seats that have indents of a thousand other tushes. And the whole cycle starts again. New York is a food town. That's what people here spend their money on. Rent and food. Ephemeral things. Experiential things. That's why we're a culture of now. Because tomorrow, you'll have to eat again. And the next day. And the next. So don't worry too much if you don't get that reservation or the line's too long. There's always the corner slice. The sandwich at the bodega. A taco truck. Tamale cart. A steamed bun filled with wonder. There's always something that wants hot sauce. Someone who has a story behind the counter. Something you can hold with your hands and be held right back. Thanks for listening to our Eat Here episode in New York City. Now you've got an appetite for it. Remember to check out the other episodes in this guide for deeper dives into New York on budget, its theater history, plus much more. Whether you're heading to New York right now, sometime in the near future, or would just like to learn all about a place I truly love, you'll get instant access to the full guide, plus new episodes on a regular basis when you subscribe to Circa. Find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or download the Circa app, where you can also get pictures and maps and notes on the places in this episode, and more. Maybe you'll want to sample our guides for Los Angeles, Barcelona, Mexico City, Hawaii, Iceland, and many more. Circa. Love the world you live in, and we'll help you explore it.